Okay. Thank you, Dario, and to Eligio and to all the organizers for giving me this opportunity to be here, to be with you this week. It is, first of all, an opportunity for me because it was uh, uh, very interesting to collect uh, the ideas that times to times I use for my work, and uh, I try to put them in some order to try to teach you. Uh, these lectures cover the topics of galactic cosmic rays and uh, some uh, multi-messenger astronomy that uh, I will deal with in the, not in this lecture, but in the following lectures, also depending to the time we take to, to deal with the, all the topics. Um, the lecture that I'm planning to give today is on very fundamental of cosmic rays. Uh, first of all, what are cosmic rays? Well, cosmic rays uh, have been uh, defined in the past, let's say, in the past century as charged particles, uh, usually ions. Now we know that also electrons and also antimatter are present in cosmic rays that arrive to the Earth. There is a year which is uh, more or less uh, uh, coincident with the discovery of cosmic rays, which is 1913 so more than one century ago, and uh, the very discovery of the cosmic radiation has been uh, assigned to a physicist whose name was from Austria and uh, whose name is Victor S., who was a very, not only a very good physicist, but also a bold person, because uh, in order to test uh, that a radiation, so a charge a radioactive component in cosmic rays uh, was uh, coming from space and not from the Earth, he decided to fly several times for a few kilometers uh, with a balloon-borne uh, device. He was on board this balloon and uh, he could measure that the intensity of this radiation increased with the eighth. And not, uh, and not the vice versa. So the, the measurements by S are date, uh, dated back in 1913 and uh, demonstrated that there is a flow of particles coming from top uh, of the atmosphere to the Earth. What are these particles? Uh, I, use, uh, I use in the following this uh, acronym to say cosmic rays. These particles are, I have just said, ions of several nuclei, at least up to iron, so many, many nuclei and uh, practically all of the isotopes of many isotopes of these nuclei have been measured by different campaign. <laughs> And uh, we can also count among the cosmic radiation the stable <coughs> leptons, which have been measured. And I will show you some experimental results in the following lecture, in the, yes, maybe tomorrow. And also antiprotons have been collected by uh, different experiments. In the following decades, and of course also in these years, there is a great activity also on the electromagnetic counterpart of uh, the radiation, and in particular in the sector of gamma rays. So gamma rays can somehow be considered cosmic rays, even if, of course, the physics is completely different because they are neutral and they are not deflected nor by the magnetic fields and they are produced in different ways. Anyway, I will spend some time also in my lectures uh, in gamma rays uh, physics because it is uh, uh, of fundamental relevance also for the understanding of the charge counterpart. And then once we have uh, uh, labeled what cosmic rays are, we should say something more in order to understand, for example, if they are from galactic or not origin. I won't deal in these lectures about solar particles. So we know, we measure a number of uh, 
particles coming from the sun. The sun has uh, uh, activity which is modulated according a 11 year cycle. Uh, somehow this activity um, modifies low energetic cosmic rays, but I had to take some decisions. So the solar physics is not part of my lectures, but be aware that uh, uh, particles, let's say more or less below the GV are coming mostly from the sun and the sun as a wind that uh, has some actions also on particles which are not of solar origin. If not solar, let's say particles uh, arriving at the Earth are first of all of galactic origin. This will be the topic of, of these lectures. And uh, in order to see, to, to decide, to understand if a, part, if a particle is of galactic origin or not, we have uh, one very rough criterion, which is uh, the energy of these particles. So cosmic rays uh, having energies, let's say, of about hundreds of MeV. This is a very generic uh, definition of cosmic rays, but uh, that extends at least uh, to 10 to the 2 or even a bit higher energies can be considered of galactic origin. The spectrum of cosmic ray, of cosmic rays, let's say, because this uh, is typical at least for all the nuclei, so from proton up to the heaviest nuclei, as a measured spectrum which is proportional to the energy at some power. And this power, very grossly, is a power of minus 2.7. So energetic particles are much more abundant than uh, uh, high energy ones. This spectrum shows a kind of discontinuity, in my figure it is very rough, but discontinuity appears at an energy of about, uh, let's say, 3, 4, 10 to the 15 electron volt, and uh, this energy, which is grossly here, so this is the energy, and this is the flux, is called by cosmic ray physicists the Ni. We have another change of slope, which occurs uh, at higher energies, which is called the ankle. And uh, the flux of this particle follows a steeper energy low from the knee to the ankle. And the ankle is uh, present at an energy of about a few 10 to the 18 electron volt. After this energy, so this is the knee and this is the ankle, the cosmic radiation shows a cutoff. Now this cutoff has been very well measured by few experiments. Uh, including, of course, the Auger experiment, which is a surface ground detector. And uh, at an energy uh, which, is, uh, which is, of course, greater than, than the ankle, we measure a cutoff. So it is not a slope change, but it is really a strong drop-off of the flux. GZK is the acronym for the three persons who predicted this. Uh, and uh, this cutoff is due to the interaction of particles. For example, I write here for the protons that interact with the photons uh, present in the cosmic ray background radiation. So it is a radio 
you have probably studied this last week. It is the radio background, a relic from the Big Bang, which is unavoidable everywhere in the galaxy, everywhere in the universe. And the cosmic rays, so these are very energetic particles. Let's say the, the Lorentz factor is beta equal to one. They are uh, fully relativistic. Interact with the CMB, they produce a delta resonance, which then decays and give, in this case, for example, protons plus pi zero or neutron plus pi plus. These particles, so the pions then decay, but what is important here is that this interaction drops the energy of the protons quite significantly, and this happens also to the nuclei. So we have a kind of horizon of cosmic rays. Namely, due to this interaction, we cannot measure particles, let's say, of infinite energies, because at some point, these energies is uh, decreased by in the unavoidable interaction with photons of the CMB. We can, for example, uh, estimate, which is the horizon, uh, the cosmic ray horizons due to the presence of this, uh, of this GZK cutoff. This uh, quantity F that uh, I'm going to, to write uh, is the fraction of cosmic rays coming from a distance greater than D. Let me make this very simple draw, hand draw, for an energy which is greater than 60 EEV, which is uh, equal to 6, 10 to the 19 electron volts. So this fraction, of course, saturates at one. And the numbers that we have here just won't, I mean, my aim is to give you uh, the orders of magnitude is megaparsecs. The nucleus, which is more affected by the interaction with the CMB, is helium. So the helium horizon, sorry, I didn't put numbers, so we have 50, 100, 150, 200, more or less. And helium is very much attenuated by the interaction with the CMB. Then we have uh, the group of nuclei, which is uh, pretty familiar in cosmic ray physics, which is C and O, namely carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, which often come together because they have very similar nuclear properties. And then uh, we have iron, which is uh, more or less uh, behaving this way, and then we have protons, which are, which have this dependence. Uh, and that means that protons are less uh, attenuated by CMB than, for example, helium. So the fraction, if, if it is 50% here, of protons coming from a distance greater than then is this distance greater than then, so 80 megaparsecs or something like that. Now, this is the only figure and the only discussion that I will give in these lectures about extragalactic cosmic rays, because you can easily see by yourself that these numbers are the order of megaparsecs, so involve uh, uh, very big dimensions with respect to the galaxy, our galaxy, I, I will depict it better in, in one of the next lectures, but uh, has a disk of luminous matter, which is with the radius of 20 kiloparsecs, kiloparsecs. So the dimensions of our galaxy are, of course, much, much smaller. And this involves uh, extragalactic particles. But this is to say, which is the power of cosmic ray physics to explore the universe.
this was the aim of this simple, this simple description. I will concentrate on galactic cosmic rays. So we will deal with the energies, let's say, between the GV and hundreds of TV. Before uh, going further, I just want to introduce you some of the notations and the quantities uh, that I will use in the following. So let me remind you that the rigidity of a particle, which is the typical physical quantity that uh, intervenes uh, when uh, particles uh, interact with magnetic fields, is uh, the momentum divided the charge of the particle. So this is the rigidity. I will use sometimes uh, the energy with uh, some index n, which is the energy divided by the number of nucleons. So it is the energy per nucleon. So except for protons, which is A equal to 1, for all the other particles, A is different from 1. So energy or energy per nucleon is not the same quantity. And the same is true for total energy or for kinetic energy. It is often useful in cosmic ray physics to use this, uh, this quantity. And then there are quantities linked to the observation of cosmic rays. I will define, we define the intensity as a quantity E, which is a number of particles divided by surface, let's say square meter, second, and steradian. We can have the differential intensity, which is uh, sometimes called the E over, the, sorry, the I over the E. Uh, and uh, often, more often, it is indicated by a letter phi, and uh, this letter phi is uh, simply called the flux. And the flux, or let's say differential intensity, is uh, um, given by the velocity of the particle. Uh, sorry, I'm okay, yes. The velocity of the particle normalized to 4 pi, which is somehow connected to the sphere surface, and then multiplied by dn over dE that I'm going to define in a while. <coughs> and this uh, dn over the E is the differential density of cosmic rays in this case. And is given by the number of, uh, of a particle per volume and per energy, and usually this energy is measured in GV. So the dimension of the flux is the number of particles divided per square meter, second, the radiant, and GV. So the main quantities that uh, will be used in the following of these lectures are whether the flux, 
which is the quantity which is observed by experiments. So a number of particles per surface, per time, per unit angle, and per unit energy. And uh, in many of the equations that I will deal, I will not use directly the flux, but this dn over the e, that not only myself, but many other authors directly write as n of e, just to drop off the differential density. But uh, uh, so it is kind of ambiguity that I want to, I mean, I make a disclaimer now. So it is formally a differential density, and sometimes we just write n for short. Um, I just want to add a few notations uh, about uh, the, the units that uh, are typical when dealing with cosmic ray physics. Usually length uh, distance is not measured in meter. Here we put meter because it is the typical unit of detectors. But uh, when dealing with distances traveled by cosmic rays, the typical unit is, is, is the kiloparsecs, which is equal more or less to 3, 10 to the 19 meters. And then instead of seconds, we will use years or mega years even. And I just remind you that one year is again 3.1 something, 10 to the 7 second. So these are units uh, which will be useful in the following, and I just anticipate a quantity that will be clear later on. There is a typical quantity which is uh, a distance squared divided time, and according to different authors, this is the diffusion coefficient, it is given in kiloparsec squared divided per mega year, which are the physical, the, let's say the, the natural units for a particle traveling in the galaxy. It travels for a long time, at least mega year if it is stable, and for typical distant galaxies. But sometimes the same quantity is given in units of, uh, let's say, meter or centimeter. And for some reason, while well, cosmic ray physicists are sometimes, uh, let's say, are affectionate to some definition, so you can find many different units. Anyway, the most common ones uh, for this very important quantity that we will see in a while are kiloparsec square per mega year or centimeter square per second. And uh, the conversion factor is, again, some 3.10 to the 29. In preparing my lectures, I have read uh, many papers and many uh, presentations by colleagues, but there are few textbooks that, if you want, you can... Uh, uh, look at for derivations of many of the quantities. There is um, a very beautiful book, let's say kind of Bible for cosmic ray physicists, which has been be written in 1990 by five Russian uh, physicists by Berezinsky, Bulanov, uh, and uh, Dogiel, and uh, Ginsburg, and Tuskin. And this book uh, is called uh, Astrophysics. Of Cosmic Rays. It is uh, now a kind of rare book because it has never been reprinted. And years ago, I was at a conference dinner and there was uh, uh, Venia Berezinski just uh, sit next to me and he told me, Fiorenza, do you know, I went to CERN library and they told me 
Professor Berezinski, your book is the most stolen at the CERN library. <laughs> he was kind of proud, let's say, not because of the stolen, but of course because uh, his book his, and his colleague's book is uh, a very, very beautiful textbook. Unfortunately, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's not been reprinted and it is kind of dual. We have one at our university in Torino, so we are very correct uh, people. It still keeps there. And there is another interesting book, very useful, for at least for a part of the topics, uh, that uh, I have uh, uh, prepared, that I will discuss, uh, which is uh, written by Malcolm Longuer. And uh, the title is uh, High Energy astrophysics. So these are uh, texts where you can study a bit more and uh, can help you in derive everything I will do in my lectures. So I will try, of course, to derive uh, all the formula, but sometimes, of course, some passages will be left to your exercise uh, so that we can proceed uh, with more topics. So now, let's start about the main physics properties of these cosmic particles. These cosmic rays, let's concentrate to galactic environment, but this is pretty generic, are charged particles. We will see how they are produced, but once they are produced, they are wandering in the galaxy, these particles encounter the galactic magnetic fields, which pervade all the galaxy, not only the galactic disk, but also some eighth from the disk. So the physics that we have to deal with is uh, the physics, let's say, of diffusion of particles or magnetic turbulence. And uh, the first thing that we should do is try to derive the main equation for these particles, for charged particles diffusing on magnetic fields. So let me again use uh, the notation that I introduced before, this N, which is in principle, it is uh, the same quantity that I introduced here, is the function of energy of position and time. Now, now I write just a one-dimensional position, but we will uh, see in a while that uh, it is, a, of course, a 3D problem. And uh, according to that definition is uh, a differential energy. So the first equation that we should keep into account from the very basics is the continuity equation for this quantity. That to say, the n over dt is equal to, sorry, minus the divergence of j. And now we try to understand what j is. So this is the continuity equation for the flowing, for the flux of the current was, or of, a, of a particle of, of ions. Uh, whose current is J. And uh, the law for J can be identified by indeed a very simple law, which is called fixed law. So this is the continuity equation. By the fixed law, which describes the variation of this J, of, let's say, finally, of this flux, in a diffusive process. And here we make uh, uh, the introduction of this quantity, I will derive better on this quantity, try to show you what are the fundamental uh, processes that uh, describe 
diffusion. This quantity here is the coefficient, usually called the diffusion coefficient, which uh, uh, tells us how intensively, how efficiently a particle is diffused in a medium. So the fixed law postulates that uh, the flux, in this case it is the, the flux of particles, flows from region of higher intensity to region of lower intensities. So let me draw very schematically So I don't uh, put here any units, just uh, I want to, to show you the physical sense of this law. So we are discussing this uh, J equal to minus some uh, coefficient, which is D, the gradient of N. And this is, uh, for example, a distance. Let me just make a very simple uh, picture in one dimension. So, for example, if uh, this gradient of N goes this way, J is the opposite and go grossly this way. And the slope is determined by D. So if the particle density decreases from the center, let's say from the center of the galaxy, of the center of the system you are considering, from the center to the outskirts of this system, the current increases from the, uh, yes, from the center to the areas, to the zones where the density is smaller. This is the sense of diffusion. And we can uh, plot another situation, just the opposite if you want. Uh, I plot the same. Just, for example, imagine that your gradient of cosmic rays goes this way, and uh, you have that J goes this way. And again, what is important is the opposite sign. That means, really, that particles goes where the density is lower, and the intensity at which this process occurs is proportional to D, to this diffusion coefficient, and we will try to derive together the physics of this diffusion coefficient. So, uh, yeah, it's not, I would need uh, some, I will look for other colors, maybe more clear for you. This uh, light blue is not very, different from white. So now we can put the two equations together. Mathematics is, is really, really uh, very, very easy. We have uh, dn over dt equal minus uh, divergence of j and j equal minus uh, d gradient of n. So if you put these two equations together, you find that the evolution with time of the cosmic ray density is given by d, sorry, the gradient of 
D. Okay. This is the correct formula. So the n over the t is equal to the divergence of d gradient n. This is the so-called diffusion equation. So it is the equation that regulates the time evolution of uh, the particle density n given a diffusion phenomenon which is uh, shaped by D. I was a bit uh, uh, quick in writing this D, this diffusion coefficient, because I know I will uh, deal with uh, later on. It is, in general, this is the diffusion coefficient, and in general, it depends on space and on energy, it could even depend on time, but uh, we don't consider this. Uh, in the simplifications that we will see in the following, we will neglect the space dependence, but in principle, the diffusion coefficient can be dependent on different environments, for example, in the galaxy. So, this is one main equation, which is uh, the diffusion equation. We will elaborate at least for two lectures around this equation. This is the term due to diffusion. There are many other terms, and I will spend uh, at least uh, two lectures in building up uh, all the terms uh, that will enrich uh, this equation in addition to diffusion. Now, Let's do some uh, very simple estimates, uh, trying to understand what this diffusion means for the typical length uh, run by a cosmic particles on the effect only of D. And in order to be uh, simpler, but effective, <coughs> Let's do in one-dimensional geometry. So in one dimension, the diffusion equation is dn over dt. Now I write a bit more explicitly. For example, the dimension is z. And let's assume that D is not dependent on Z. So it is only dependent on energy. In this case, we have here D, the N differentiated twice with respect to Z as a function of E, Z, and T. So this is the diffusion equation in one dimension with only energy dependent uh, diffusion coefficient. Uh, the solution to this equation is the following. You can uh, find yourself, uh, you did in the past of your math courses. It is a solution which depends, of course, on n and t. It is uh, normalized by n zero and uh, we have divided by the square root of 4p diffusion equation, a uh, diffusion coefficient time, and this is an exponential. And it is an exponential of z squared divided for d t. So this solution, you see, it uh, goes to zero for z uh, infinite. So at enormous distance, you don't have uh, particles. And zero is the normalization. You choose, for example, boundary conditions such that n zero is your solution at t equals zero and z equals zero. And another boundary condition is that n 
infinite uh, infinite is equal to zero, which is uh, directly expressed by the solution itself. So now let's compute the average distance traveled by a particle under this, uh, this effect. Let's compute a quantity, we call it diffusive distance, and we compute this way, the diffusive distance squared we defined as the average of z for any time. And this is the integral minus infinite plus infinite of z squared n And this is normalized to n so the solution is this one, and let me shortly call n equal to a coefficient which is a and the exponential of minus z square over beta square. So a is uh, um, n0 divided for pi dt and beta square is 4 We can integrate uh, the denominator, so minus infinite plus infinite, uh, the integral of a exponential of minus z squared divided beta squared, the z, we make uh, the substitution, z prime equal to z over beta, and uh, the integral becomes the integral of a beta e minus z prime squared the z prime. The solution is, is the integral of a Gaussian, so in principle it is an error function that now we have to take from minus infinite to plus infinite. So the solution is, well, the coefficients, square root of pi divided by 2, the error function of z taken plus minus infinite, that is... Uh, a beta square root of 2 divided by 2, 1 plus 1, which is A beta square root of pi. And then very similarly, we integrate the, num the numerator, which is uh, the integral. If you make the same substitution here in Z prime, it is the integral of a beta square z prime squared e minus z, z prime squared. We have another beta dz prime, so the, the integral is, is uh, 
tabulated and the solution, the, the, the result is uh, A, beta squared, which are the coefficient, and the solution, the, the computation of this integral is one fourth square root of pi, the error function of x minus 2z exponential of minus z square. And uh, this has been, uh, has to be computed between plus and minus infinite. And if you put uh, the exact streams, this goes to zero. You only have the error function, which taken again is one and minus one. So this result uh, finally is a beta cube square root of pi divided by two. So let's come back to what we wanted to compute, which is the diffusive distance, which is A, B cube, square root of pi half, divided A, beta, square root of pi, equal one half, beta square equal one half four dt. So the typical diffusive length run by a cosmic particle diffusing on magnetic fields is the square root of two times the diffusion equation times the time it takes to diffuse. This is a one-dimensional problem I told you before. If you do the same computation in uh, n dimension, usually, of course, we are interested in two or three, the diffuse, diffusive length is uh, two times uh, the number of dimension. So in three dimension, you have square root of six uh, dt. So since uh, we have this, uh, let's say, simple, sorry, I'm too powerful. Let's compute a typical number. <coughs> Let's put some numbers. So this number I give to you, and I, you have to wait a couple of lectures before to understand how we derive it. But let's assume that the diffusion coefficient is a number, a normalization, times the rigidity, let's normalize it to one gigavolt to some power delta. So just take this for granted. This uh, D zero is often uh, in the galaxy derived of the order 10 to the 28, 10 to the 29 centimeter squared per second. Let's don't, I mean, we don't do any assumption on delta, so we put uh, at one gigavolt of rigidity. So we are doing this analysis from a specific energy, which is one gigavolt. The typical diffusion time is of the order of mega years. So these numbers are, I mean, you have to trust me. But uh, if they are correct, the typical diffusion, diffusive 
length traveled by this particle is, uh, it will be the square root of, uh, let's say, 6, I do in dimension uh, 6, in dimension 3, sorry, and this is, uh, this is 6. Let's put 10 to the 29 centimeters squared of a second, and then uh, this is for mega, and this is for years. I just wrote before, 3, 10 to the 7 seconds. And we take the square root of this. <coughs> so if you put numbers there, you see that you come out with some uh, square root of 18, 10 to the 21 centimeter. And uh, this number is, uh, I just put very rough numbers because uh, it's more... I mean, a rough estimation that I want to make. It is of the order of few kiloparsecs. Are there some questions? Is everything fine? Okay. So, if the diffusion coefficient, which is typical of the galaxy, is of that order of magnitude 10 to the 28, 10 to the 29 centimeters square per second, if a particle travels one mega year in this uh, diffusion environment, it will typically travel few kiloparsecs if this particle is at one gigavolt of rigidity, one GV if it is a proton. A more energetic particle, uh, the rigidity I put one gigavolt, you can for example put one TV, one teravolt, and, of course, at this point, we should define delta. Delta is a mild dependence. Very roughly, let's put 0.5 at, at the moment. So, if we take a more energetic particle, so rigidity 1 TV, delta 0 0.5, you can see, this is very easy to, to derive, that the diffusive length is, uh, is bigger, is significantly bigger. So more energetic particles diffusing in the same magnetic field, of course, travel a much more uh, longer distance. The distance of 25 kiloparsecs is uh, bigger than the typical radius of the galaxy. Anyway, the motion of a particle in a magnetic field is a random motion. So it's not a straight motion, of course. It is a particle that encounters the turbulence of the magnetic field and it is continuously deflected. And now I would like to make some steps with you to understand a bit better uh, what these deflections uh, that uh, induce diffusion are physically. And there is, uh, let's say, kind of first principle, a, a fundamental law that you have studied probably during your second year uh, at the university. And, uh, the force that rules a charged particle in a, an electromagnetic field is the Lorentz force. So now we elaborate a little bit on this. So the description of a charged particle in a regular magnetic field
is given by f, or if you want, dp over dt, which is equal to the charge of this particle, electric field plus the external beam. So Q is the charge of the particle, V it is uh, its velocity, and B and uh, E are the electromagnetic field in which uh, it is uh, it propagates. The motion of this particle has uh, a typical frequency, which is the Larmo frequency, that I remind you is omega L. For short, I will call it omega. I won't put L in the following, and it is the charge, the magnetic field, divided, let's say, the momentum taken relativistically. This is... Uh, uh, generically a magnetic field, but what happens in the galaxy is that the magnetic field uh, indeed, uh, or uh, this is, as uh, a uniform component plus uh, some perturbation of the magnetic field. So let's assume small inhomogeneities of the magnetic field. So we have uh, B0, and the perturbation of the magnetic field. We will work here under the assumption that these perturbations are not very large. I can work here. Good. So, this is the first hypothesis, and the other hypothesis that we assume from now on is that the medium in which these charged particles are moving is neutral. Which is more or less true, unless some uh, specific zones of the galaxy. So let's write the Lorentz force, dp over dt, equal to q v, and we have b, which is the, uh, b0, the uniform component, plus delta b. Well, now uh, I first want to, not really to derive, just to write some result that uh, one can get separately and then elaborate a bit. But let me uh, point it out that any time you have, uh, uh, let's say, ions, so charged particles as it is the case here, and uh, a magnetic field, there are oscillations due to interaction of one of the other, and uh, these oscillations create waves, which are called alphen waves. So the alphen waves uh, are uh, waves that occur in a plasma, which is the case of our charged particles, resulting from the interaction of magnetic fields and the electric currents, which are the, the particles indeed. So, these uh, alpha waves are typical of the galactic environment in which we find, I repeat, magnetic fields and ions, and uh, have a speed which usually is very much lower than the speed of the particles. And this speed can be computed. So I just give you some uh, 
equations and the result. I don't want to concentrate on this, but I will come again on the alpha and weights and the alpha and speed because it will enter in the diffusion equation. So this is the reason why I want to hint at that. The coupling of charged particles and the magnetic field is such that we can uh, derive these equations, uh, which I said I, I, I don't derive, just uh, write directly. So we have a perturbation in the velocity of the particle, which is, uh, of the velo yes, the, the velo velocity of the charged particles, uh, which is uh, uh, changing with the time, and this is given by the average of the magnetic field divided 4 pi rho, and rho is the density of the plasma. And it is uh, connected to the space deviation of the perturbation of the magnetic field. So the perturbation of the space perturbation of the magnetic field modify the velocity of the particle. And the double derivative over time of delta B is uh, connected to the properties of the particle. So B squared divided 4 pi rho, and we have D to Z delta V. So these are two differential couple equations, and uh, I don't want to solve them now, but just to outline that these two equations are correlated by this quantity here, b squared divided by rho, which is uh, a speed. And this is the so-called Alfven speed, which is vr, and it is equal to the square root of this quantity. So the square root gives b divided the square root of 4 pi rho. The speed is the speed of the magnetic waves, uh, which are the result of the oscillation of the interactions of ions and the inhomogeneities of the magnetic field. If you put uh, realistic numbers, which are nevertheless always very uh, difficult to estimate because of this B, which is uh, far from uh, trivial to derive, anyway, one can find that typical alpha waves have a speed of the order of, let's say, few tens of kilometers per second which is a very low dis, uh, speed with respect to the speed of the particle, which usually are relativistic, so much higher. Now, let's come back to our Lorentz force and try to understand how it can uh, hint at a diffusion in space. So I write it again, dp over dt. Well, as all the physicists, sometimes I put speed of light equal to one, sometimes it will appear again, so everything must be checked against some factor of c. Uh, v, delta b. So, the situation is, this is the magnetic field, the regular magnetic field. Let's assume that 
the direction of the magnetic field is Z. So B is equal to, I called it B0, sorry. B0 is equal to B0, the direction of Z. And we have a particle. This is the particle. And this is uh, the angle between uh, the momentum of the particle and the direction of the magnetic field. This angle theta is called the pitch angle. And now we try to elaborate a bit on this angle because uh, it is eventually the modification of this angle that makes a particle diffusing. So this is the physics that I want to do now. So in order to do this, uh, let's write the particle. Uh, we, we are interested in the particle momentum, the particle speed. Uh, with respect to B, the momentum of the particle is a parallel and an orthogonal component with respect to B, to the magnetic field. So we have that the parallel component is P cosinus and the orthogonal is P sinus theta. So indeed we have, uh, this is Z, this is X, this is Y, we have B0, and we have uh, a particle which makes, a, we, whose momentum, whose speed makes an angle theta with respect to Z. This particle propagates and rotates, spiralizes around around Z0. Remember uh, omega? I remind you that it is Q V0 divided N C gamma. And now we can write the three components, Px, Py, and Pz for the particle. So Px is uh, P orthogonal for the cosinus of uh, omega T plus, uh, let's say, a uh, phase I call phi. And uh, this is P sinus theta cosine omega T plus phi. Py is uh, given by minus P orthogonal sinus omega t plus phi, that is minus P sin theta sinus omega t plus phi, and Pz is equal to P parallel, that is P cos theta.
So now let's take again in our hands the Lorentz force. The Lorentz force involves the derivative of the momentum. That is what I want to, to do now to uh, write the evolution over the time of the pitch angle, which is in P. So the only uh, component whose variation is uh, different from zero is the P parallel computed uh, on the T. And this is uh, Q, now I'm good and uh, remind that there is uh, a speed uh, of the light somewhere. V orthogonal external delta B. So that is, uh, this is the derivative of PC cos theta over time. And this is uh, Q and then we have uh, the modulus of uh, V orthogonal of uh, delta B and now we have a quantity which is the cosinus of uh, the angle between V and the magnetic field, the perturbation of the magnetic field. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, it is in direction and in amplitudes uh, it depends, uh, yes. Now we assume a small one which is uh, in direction, uh, modified in direction. So let's put uh, some more detailed expression for the speed, which is uh, Vx squared plus uh, Vy squared, which is uh, uh, the square root of uh, V orthogonal squared, cosinus squared, omega t plus phi plus v squared orthogonal sinus squared omega t plus phi and this is square root. And if you do the computation you find uh, that it is equal to v square root of 1 minus, uh, you, you should have all the elements to derive uh, this expression. So let's write uh, in some more detail now the derivation of a time of PC cos theta. This is equal to Q V 1 minus cos squared of theta. The perturbation of the magnetic field and the angle between the two quantities, speed and delta B. And we can write this angle as, well, of course, omega T plus phi minus K, uh, I'm putting here X, yes, we should be, okay. Where we introduce the wave number here and we, elaborate on it in a while. So usually people write uh, this equation, the same equation defining 
the uh, cosinus of the pitch angle as mu. So typically in books and in notes, you will find the equation for mu. So I do the same. And we are evaluating the mu over the t. And I just rewrite. It is q divided pc, because I am invert here, v 1 minus mu squared delta b cos omega t plus phi minus kx. So we have rewritten the equation for the Lorentz force, which was our, let's say, first principle, in terms of the time evolution of the pitch angle. I remind you again, this is, uh, physically, this is very, very important. This pitch angle is the angle between the speed of the particle and the magnetic field. And now let's try to consider the evolution, the average evolution with time of mu, so of the pitch angle, finally. You can uh, show, because of uh, the average of the cosinus, so it's, uh, it's pretty simple, that if you take the average the average of mu over time, this is zero. This is not the case for the variation of d mu, d mu, that now we try to see together. So let's compute, or at least see how to compute, the variation of the pitched angle at two different moments. And uh, yes, this was phi. One take the average, and uh, one finds uh, q squared divided by pc squared, v squared, one minus mu squared, delta b, again squared, and then you have here one half. So I, I skip this computation indeed, otherwise it gets very long, but uh, I think that the result uh, is, uh, is, is easy to, to see. And it is the cosinus of uh, uh, omega minus k mu v times t1 minus t2. So this is one first step that we have to compute, and this I let you for your exercise, otherwise uh, we don't uh, end. And uh, the final result that it is interesting to us is also the average over these two times. So you take that quantity and you average, so you integrate over dt1 and dt2. And if one makes uh, this further average, one can derive this quantity for the delta mu, let's say, the variation, the squared variation of delta mu over the t, which is uh, factors, namely q squared, pc squared, v over mu, 1 minus uh, mu squared, 
delta b squared and then there is a delta function k minus omega v mu delta t. This is uh, a result whose most integral piece is this one. This delta function here tells us that the variation of the pitch angle, so the direction of the momentum of the particle with the magnetic field, has a variation whenever you have this particle meets a resonance. More realistically, we don't have only one variation of delta B, but we have a spectrum. This is also a partial answer to the question. We have more generically the spec a spectrum of perturbations of the magnetic field. So instead of, putting, of putting just delta B, one should put uh, a spectrum of perturbation. Usually, we can indicate with the uh, P as a function of K, which is uh, a number of perturbation B. Usually it is normalized to 4P. So instead of delta B, we put uh, P times this normalization factor. Anyway, also in this more generic treatment, nothing changes the dissolution for this average is, uh, uh, let's say, is set on a resonance. And the resonance involves the wave number. So maybe I will, ah, oh, no, okay. The resonance, the resonance is for K, and K is here, is the wave number that rules the propagation of this quantity of mu, the evolution of mu. So, in a more generic way, but I just re rewrite this, the mu over the mu on delta t is, uh, is equal to q squared, 1 minus mu squared, there is a pi, and then we have m squared, c squared, gamma squared. So 4 pi divided v mu, the integral of, uh, on, on the wave uh, number k, the spectrum of uh, B, yes, here I wrote this uh, underscore, but it is better to write this way, uh, normalized to 4 pi, times this delta function of k minus uh, omega on over v mu. So this uh, resonant wave number is uh, equal to omega v mu, don't forget that mu is the cosine of our pitch angle. And this result is, uh, uh, is important because the solution to this variation depends strongly on the fact that there is a resonance on with, let's say, that involves the pitch angle, and this is the Larmor frequency, and the Larmor frequency is proportional to the magnetic field I have wrote a couple of times before. 
physically this is, uh, this is very relevant for diffusion. So the random variation of the pitch angle can be, this, let's say, in, uh, of a charged particle that interacts with the magnetic turbulence can be described by a kind of diffusion coefficient. Now I write the diffusion coefficient lead to the pitch angle, and then uh, we elaborate on this, which is given, we can, it is the same as uh, cos theta cos theta, and uh, we can write it uh, as the variation of uh, the pitch angle, and it is uh, given by pi divided by 4 omega, sorry, sometimes I wrote capital omega, but it is just a confusion in my notes. It is always the Larmor frequency. This uh, resonance, which is here, the, the resonance in the wave number, time, let's say, a function which describes the power spectra uh, of the magnetic field at resonance. So, again, maybe I can write uh, the Larmor frequency, which is proportional to the magnetic field. The resonance key is there, and this function F, sorry, K resonance uh, should be given by the spectrum of the inhomogeneity is normalized to be zero. But independently on uh, the specific form for this function, what is relevant here is that a diffusion, a modification of this pitch angle is possible. It happens when we, when this particle has a wave number resonant in this way, and it is ruled by the intensity of the magnetic field. A bit more generically, we can write this diffusion term for the pitch angle as a diffusion, more generically, diffusion coefficient in space. So this theory lets us to write a form for the diffusion coefficient of a charged particle interacting with the magnetic field, and this interaction leads to a modification of the pitch angle, and namely a random diffusion in this environment, which is by the way, the galaxy, for example. This diffusion term, I write it, uh, this was an hypothesis at the beginning uh, of my treatment that the diffusion was only dependent on energy and not on space. One can complicate this, but for these letters, uh, we define uh, the diffusion coefficient as a function of the momentum or the energy. And uh, this is equal, so just take the factor is uh, uh, for granted, but uh, um, in one dimension, which is our original treatment, 
it is uh, the average of the variation of the z over the z, the z is linked to cos theta over time. And uh, if one sets the coefficient, which is not the a here, uh, it is uh, one third, and then we have uh, the Larmor radius, which is the opposite of omega. So the Larmor radius is one over omega, and omega is written here. The speed of the particle time this function times the inverse of the function which let's say takes into account grazie, takes into account the perturbation of the magnetic field. So this is uh, one of the main results that I wanted to uh, get this money with you that uh, shows that starting from first principle of propagation of charge particles in a magnetic field, uh, the, the theory, which is, uh, which is finally the Lorentz force and uh, uh, not that much more, predicts a diffusion in space dependent on the spectrum of turbulence of the magnetic field. So you can say, okay, easy. Well, not that easy because uh, what is not easy at all for understanding the diffusion coefficient of a particle in the galaxy is the spectrum of turbulence of magnetic field. And as I will show you later on, uh, very often we completely skip any prediction on uh, PK or whatever and directly go to cosmic rays to understand the turbulence of the galaxy, which is a bit uh, uh, weird maybe, because uh, we are usually, that are young and me, used to start from first principles and try to derive uh, uh, the right quantities. Anyway, this is uh, a way uh, to write uh, the diffusion coefficient in space for a particle. At every resonance, the particle gets a change, a random change, in the pitch angle. And one resonance after the other, the particles gets one deflection after the other and diffuses randomly in the galaxy, in the magnetic fields of the galaxy. This is the diffusion on, in space. There is also a diffusion in uh, energy. We will see this uh, maybe surely next time. And uh, in the time that I have left, I start uh, uh, to, to see with you two points that are key in the propagation uh, and in the acceleration of particles in the, uni in, in the galaxy. So now we have seen that the charged particles, if put in a magnetic field, diffuses randomly. And uh, the typical diffusion length in a galactic environment is of the order of kiloparsecs. Nice. But how can this particle get the energies, the very high energies that we observe with our cosmic ray detectors? The person who first understood how particles can be accelerated to relativistic energies was Enrico Fermi. He wrote a wonderful paper. Now we write, uh, the, I don't know, we always say, okay, we start with a short paper and we end up with uh, 20 pages papers that probably are, not probably, that are, I mean, not so easy to read. Enrico Fermi wrote a wonderful paper, I think four pages, uh, in which uh, after having discovered the properties of uh, beta decay and so on and so forth, he always also understood how particles can be accelerated. And uh, the mechanism that accelerate particles, uh, at least in galactic environments, are of two types, and they are called Fermi acceleration of first order 
and Fermi acceleration of second order. Fermi first proposed an acceleration which is the second order one, and then uh, some years later other scientists uh, modified slightly this uh, second order uh, Fermi acceleration to understand that there can be also a first order acceleration which, is, uh, which can be much more efficient than the second order ones and that now we believe uh, is the mechanism that uh, let protons and also electrons and nuclei to reach the very high energies uh, that we observe at our cosmic ray detectors. So, um, I don't know if starting, we have very few minutes. Maybe I can stop here, and uh, if you have questions, uh, of course, I'm happy to try to answer to you. Anyway, tomorrow we can see uh, these two processes in some more detail, uh, since they need some computation time. Only lunch, maybe, it's time. Anyway, I'm around all the week, so if you have some uh, questions in the following, uh, you can ask me. Okay, thank you.